Welcome to this lesson on dimensional analysis. I can't lie, this is one of my favorite screencasts of the entire course. Um, I think it's a chance to learn something uh, exciting and unexpected. Um, so we had this fact from our, our, our basic, uh, basic facts about dimensions that quantities have to have identical dimensions if you're gonna add, subtract, or compare them, okay? Um, and from this rule, it turns out we can deduce things about the universe, non-trivial things um, that are going to be kind of amazing, actually, that you can get this kind of information just out of knowing dimensions. Uh, I realize this sounds a little vague now. I'm going to outline it with uh, two examples uh, for the rest of the screencast. These examples have a sequence of steps. I don't want you to memorize the steps. I just want you to understand what's going on. Um, you know, so that it becomes organic for you, sort of memorizing nine different steps or something like that is not a super productive way to, to understand this technique. Um, I also want to say that I'm purposefully only giving you uh, examples and problems that work with the simple technique you're learning here. There are slightly more complicated um, techniques of dimensional analysis that will apply to harder problems than the one that you're seeing in this course, but um, I wanted you to, uh, to at least see the simple ones here. So for our first example, we're going to think about the height of a projectile. You have a ball of mass m, you throw it directly up in the air, you get to choose the velocity with which you initially throw it up, and you wonder how high that ball goes. Step one is just to identify the relevant quantities. I want to be clear, this is an assumption, this is a guess, okay? But we're going to guess that what matters is the ball's mass m, the velocity v, gravity g, and the ball's height h. Next, we want to choose what are the dependent and independent variables. The dependent variable is the thing you want to figure out, right? The thing we've asked is how high does the ball go, so our dependent variable is h, the ball's height. The independent variables are everything else, the mass, the velocity, and gravity. Next step is to just list the dimensions of all quantities. So the height of the ball, that's a distance, dimensions are l. The ball's mass, dimensions capital M. Velocity has dimensions length per time, and gravity is an acceleration that has dimensions L t to the minus two. The next thing we do, the next thing we do is sort of the fun, the the key step of dimensional analysis, and it's that we we guess that our dependent variable is proportional to a generalized product of the independent variables. Okay, so we say that um, h, our height, is equal to mass to the a, velocity to the b g to the c, where a, b, and c, those exponents, are to be determined, and we'll see how we determine them, okay? Now, remember that proportional to means a constant times, so h is proportional to this generalized product, and k here is a dimensionless uh, constant of proportionality. So I've rewritten steps three and four here at the top of the slide just for convenience, the new step now is step five, where we take this equation from step four and just write down the dimensions of each side. So the dimensions of the left side, h, well, those are just l. The dimensions of the right side are a little more complicated. k has no dimensions. m to the a has dimensions big M to the a. v to the b has dimensions lt to the minus one, all to the b power. And g to the c has dimensions lt to the minus two, all to the c power. And we can actually just take this expression here and combine uh, all the m's, all the l's, and all the t's. And if you do that, we get m to the a, l to the b plus c, t to the minus b minus 2c. Okay? Now here's the key part. This equation, since we're assuming this equation makes sense, the dimensions of the left-hand side have to equal the dimensions of the right-hand side. That means these dimensions, l, have to equal these dimensions here. Okay? And so the way we make that be true is by looking at the, ex uh, the exponents of the m's, the l's, and the t's. Okay, so here's what I mean. For the uh, m's, we have no powers of m over here on the left, no powers of m at all. On the right, we have m to the a power. So power of 0 on the left equals power of a on the right. For the l's, we have l to the first power right here. We just have a single l. So power of one on the left, that's this one here, equals the power of L on the right, that's B plus C. So one equals B plus C. And then for our T's, we have zero powers of T on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we have an exponent of minus B minus two C. 
So this is a system of three equations and three unknowns. It's straightforward to solve these. The first equation is trivially done. Second two equations, if you like, you can take these and add them together. Okay, the b's will cancel out. You will find that um, minus c equals 1, so that c equals negative 1. Then if you want, you can take that value of c equals negative 1, plug it into the second equation here, and you'll find that b equals 2. So your solution, a equals 0, b equals 2, c equals negative 1, that's what has to be true for the dimensions of this to equal the dimensions of this. Next, we just substitute to get the final answer. So here is the expression we had written down for h. We found a is 0, b is 2, and c is minus 1. So substituting, we have h equals k, m to the 0, so that just goes away. And we have v squared, g to the minus 1. Or we can write that as h equals k, v squared over g. Next step is for us to use this information. We can interpret it. So one thing is that h depends both on v and g. So the launch velocity and gravity both affect the maximum height. Something else is that you remember that the power of m, which was a here, turned out to be zero. And this means that mass doesn't matter, right? So in this example, the mass of the ball does not affect how high it goes. We can also get some trends out of our answer. So increasing v, if we make v the launch velocity bigger, that will increase h because it makes the numerator bigger. So as v goes up, h goes up. Also, if gravity were to get heavier, if we were to go to a planet where the acceleration due to gravity was bigger, um, that makes a bigger denominator. So the value of h, the maximum height, would go down. As gravity goes up, maximum height goes down. We can even get a little more specific, right? Like we can ask what happens if we double v. So if we replace v with 2v, then v squared gets replaced by 2v squared which is 4v squared, right? So instead of having v squared over g, we would have like 4v squared over g. So that means that doubling v increases the maximum height by a factor of four. So we sort of get that scaling of how much does the height increase at what power um, as we increase v. And I hope you're saying wow by now. I mean, in case you're not, I'll just make that step nine, say wow. Uh, because this is, I find this to be amazing. Like we didn't use any physics to figure this out. Just from the mere fact that uh, quantities carry dimensions, uh, we were able to deduce all of this information about this problem. I find this to be totally amazing. Um, and I find it so amazing that I actually want to do a second example with you. And this is about vocal cord frequency. So here's the basic setup is imagine that there's an organism's vocal cords and you imagine them like as a string. So they're like a one dimensional object, they're a line. And we want to know how the frequency of the sound that's produced by an organism's vocal cords depends on their length, L, their tension, S, and tension is a force, and then their mass density. Now, usually density means mass per volume, but this is, since this is a one-dimensional object, it means how much mass is contained in a unit length, right? How much mass is contained in a unit length? That mass per unit length is called the mass density, and we're going to call it the Greek letter mu. So that's the problem. Step one, identify the relevant quantities. This is always an assumption, um, but we're just going to use the information I've told you. There's the frequency f, the length l, the tension s, which is a force, and the mass density mu, which is a mass per unit length. The next thing we do is we identify which is the dependent and independent variables. The dependent variable is the one we want to figure out. That's the frequency. We want to know what's the frequency. Everything else, length, tension, and mass density, those are the independent variables. Next, we list the dimensions of all the quantities. Frequency means per time, so dimensions are t to the minus 1. Length has dimensions capital L. S is a force. Tension is a force. So its dimensions are those of mass times acceleration. That's m, l, t to the minus 2 and mu was a mass per unit length, so that's ml to the minus one. Next, we write the dependent variable proportional to a generalized product of the independent ones. So frequency equals a dimensionless constant times L to the A, S to the B, mu to the C, where A, B, and C are the things we would like to figure out. I've repeated steps three and four here for reference. The new step is step five, where we write the dimensional version of this equation, the starred one. Right? So frequency has dimensions time to the minus one. 
On the right hand side, k is dimensionless, so it contributes nothing. L to the a has dimensions capital L to the a. S to the b has dimensions m l t to the minus 2, all to the b power. Um, and then uh, mu to the c has dimensions m l to the minus 1, all to the c power. And if we combine all the t's and l's and m's, we get t to the minus 2b, l to the a plus b minus c, and m to the b plus c. And now we're going to use dimensional compatibility, right? We're going to use the fact that these dimensions on the left must equal these dimensions on the right for it to make sense for these two quantities in here to be connected by an equal sign. And if we do that, um, we get these equations here. So from the t's, on the left-hand side, we have a, a power of minus 1. And on the right-hand side, we had minus 2b. For the l's, we have no powers of l on the left-hand side, so 0. And on the right-hand side, we have a plus b minus c. That's here. And then for the m's, we have no powers of m on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we have b plus c. So this is, again, three linear equations and three unknowns. You learn how to solve these in algebra. If you solve them, um, you find a equals minus 1, b equals 1 half, and c equals minus 1 half. You're welcome to plug in those values and make sure that they work. So now we substitute that information in. Here was our original expression. We now know the values of a, b, and c. And what we find is that frequency is k, l to the minus 1, s to the 1 half, mu to the minus 1 half. We can remember that a half power means a square root, and a minus means put it in the denominator. So we can actually write this as frequency equals k over l, square root of s over mu. And then as always, you want to interpret and do something with this information. So we're going to look at this expression here. Um, and we can see that if we increase L, increase the length of the vocal cords, that's in the denominator, so the frequency will go down. S, which is the tension, the force in the vocal cords, if we increase it, if those vocal cords get tighter, that's increasing something in a numerator, so the frequency will go up. And if the mass density were to increase, that's something in the, the, dom in the denominator, so the frequency would go down. Um, we can even get more specific than that, right? So if we were to double the... Um, length of the vocal cords, that's doubling the denominator, um, so this would decrease f by a factor of 2. On the other hand, if we doubled mu, that's in the denominator, but it appears under a square root, so this would decrease f only by a factor of the square root of 2, so we can see what is the comparative effect of changing one of these parameters versus the other. Um, and once again, as always, I hope you will say, wow, because the fact that you were able to figure all of this out just using units, not knowing anything about biology or physics, um, I find to be really amazing. And so let's just wrap up. Uh, there's, I just want you to ask yourself if you can determine natural dependencies by a dimensional analysis, just as we've done in these two examples here, at least for simple problems. And I even want to ask yourself if you can say, wow, in other words, if you can appreciate how um, sort of surprising and amazing this actually is. All right, thanks for listening.